Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 237. We're continuing with our title, Twilight for Humanity. This will be part 4. Scripture indicates the beginning of sorrows will be a time of divine intervention. A divine intervention in the affairs of humanity. It will start with an expression of God's anger at the foolish, degenerate state of man's existence on the earth. Jeremiah 25, verse 30. <coughs> Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout, as they that tread, against all the inhabitants of the earth. The Lord is going to be furious. He is going to be <clears throat> basically in a state of <clears throat> extreme anger at the human race. Yes. What is he most angry at? The, the guys pretending Christian teachers, leaders, he's most upset about them. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> but yeah, he's angry at everybody. He's angry at <clears throat> the, the foolishness of human thinking. He's angry at the lack of <clears throat> a will to discern what's taking place. And above all, he's angry at those who should be <clears throat> custodians, those who have shirked their responsibility and taken advantage of their positions. We can see this <clears throat> taking place every day. Uh, what happens is people don't comprehend God. They look at God from a human perspective. If you get angry with somebody, you immediately respond by expressing your anger. God stores up his wrath over a protracted period of time. Just because he doesn't instantly respond to stupidity and deprivation does not mean that he's not angry at it. Sure. It means he hasn't responded to it sure. yet. Yes. It seems to me, Mr. Jones, those that you've quoted this many times, those that are saying they are pastors or, or leaders or some, some kind of teacher in, in Christianity and have turned it into a profitable endeavor, mm -hmm. in other words, selling the product that sells itself, that is a detestation when they should be teaching the truths in the Word, but what they're doing is they're making a profit off of the Word by distorting it and, and misquoting it and misplacing it. And so that would seem to me to be the the utmost of hypocrisy and uh, and just and do justice should be poured upon them. Well, perhaps. we see how Jesus treated those in the temple. <coughs> he was angry. <coughs> he was in a rage. We see how he looked, and he dealt with the scribes and the Pharisees. Matthew twenty six. He called them a generation of vipers and serpents and enumerated the sins that they were committing and what their ultimate destiny was going to be. Well, what we see here is God carrying it out. Right. <coughs> Let me ask you a question. Sure. So at the point of 
the voice, <coughs> calling out the judgment. From that point on, the age of grace has ended, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So therefore, we are back to the laws of sin and death yes. for those who are not in Christ. Yes. If somebody should carry out a transgression, which of course they will within three seconds of that shout, they're not in Christ, they carry out a transgression. Do they get an additional judgment to the one that's already got upon them? They're not going to have time. Hmm. Because as soon as he speaks, you know, all we need to do word immediately so begins out. to take effect. Sure. They're going to have time to do anything but succumb to the judgment right. that's been pronounced. <clears throat> Which brings us to the second principle. Scripture teaches it will be a time of division. The Lord's judgment will only fall on the wicked. Turn to 2 Peter. <clears throat> uh, 2 chapter, verse 9, then we're going to go to back to Jeremiah. 2 Peter, 2 chapter, verse 9. <clears throat> The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Jeremiah 25, verse 30. To be punished. Now we'll go back to Jeremiah 25, verse 31. <clears throat> A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. So it's the wicked that these demons are going to congregate onto <clears throat> and incite to destruction. Scripture teaches the Lord will call forth those who he calls his sheep. John 10, verse 16. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So, they're going to be brought to a place where they hear his voice. <clears throat> and if they hear his voice, of course, that's at the gathering. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches the Lord has prepared a global group who will come out of obscurity to lead them to the Lord's gathering. There is a global group who at that point will come out of obscurity to lead his sheep to the place where they will hear his voice. What does the leadership look like? What will they be doing to lead? Well, first let's turn to the Scripture. Matthew... 24, verse 
verse 45. <clears throat> As you're turning, <clears throat> Scripture teaches the Lord has prepared a global group that will come out of obscurity to lead them to the Lord's gathering. Verse 45, Matthew 24. <clears throat> Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? What is the due season when they're going to get meat? At the time of the beginning of sorrows. How has this happened? The Lord's prepared them to be over his household in eternity. So everything is going to coalesce starting with his judgment pronouncement, the wicked being taken out of the way, <clears throat> the Luciferian pseudo-reality being neutralized, those that are called from eternity who are global will begin to lead his household to the point in which they will be gathered and hear his voice at the beginning of sorrows will those who will become the elders once the Luciferian influence has been neutralized wake up as if out of a dream and look around and think oh my god where, where am I? No, these are the sheep that are being led they got to be taught but most of those are coming out of other religions yes so it will be as if they're in a completely new reality <clears throat> oh sure well in that respect it will be a totally new world mm. they won't how would I put it this way? They will come into their own. Okay. The reality of who they are, what their calling is, it's going to be over or the, 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 whole, cons, uh, the whole essence and quintessence of their thinking will be focused in that direction. <clears throat> Scripture teaches this global group will be responsible for bringing the sheep to salvation from every area of the human race. So in Revelation 5, verse 9. Okay, how is it that those that are going to be part of the gathering that are coming from other religions are going to consider the... The, the, the new things that they're going to hear. And I know that the Father plants or draws or he does something that indicates in that you're supposed to go investigate this. You're supposed to be part of this or something like that. So then when you started to, to uh, quote the scripture where no one comes to the Father unless you know, he be drawn. So now that means those that are coming out of religion, other religions, being part of the gathering, they're drawn and they're also receptive to, to receive. Yes. Yes, the Father <clears throat> is going to draw His Son out of obscurity, just like the teachers are going to be drawn to step into what they have been prepared for. The Father does all these things through the Spirit. The Spirit is going to be active on the prototokis. And the prototokis is going to be responsive to the Spirit. <clears throat> when Jesus talked about when He comes, He will convict. The Spirit even operates on unsafe people that are not called. They can become responsive. If they know to have done something wrong, they come under conviction. <clears throat> and they have a choice. Either pursue to come to salvation or reject and go, you know, reject what's being happened. The Spirit works on everybody. And now, the scripture that we were discussing, <clears throat> the global group that's responsible for bringing the sheep to salvation from every area of the human race, Revelation 5, verse 9. <clears throat> And they sung a new song, saying, <clears throat> Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, 
and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. <clears throat> Referring to every aspect of the human race. It's going to be represented here. It's going to be representative from every tongue, racial group, cultural group, linguistic group. It's going to be here. Now, having said that, <clears throat> these are the elders. That's what they ultimately wind up being. They don't start off as elders. You have to instruct them as they're being led to the place where they will hear the Lord's voice when he descends from heaven. That's when this, the, the clock starts ticking, this is exactly, as I see it, what is going to happen. The Father's going to move upon <clears throat> the Prototokos teachers to comprehend where they are, what they're supposed to do, and the direction that they should take. All spirit-led. Jesus didn't have any problem knowing what he needed to do when the Holy Spirit came upon him when he was baptized in the Jordan River. Sure. So, should we understand, therefore, that the teachers of those elders? These? Yes. Okay. The teachers of the teachers is what, I'm, what I really mean, us I'm referring to, have to be in place, from my estimation, it's about two to three years before the beginning of Sorrows. Don't uh, they have to be yes. prepared as yes. teachers? Oh, yes, they've got to be prepared. Right. Sure, sure. So, so, therefore, the teachers on, on our level, all around the world, are already in place. It's not, in other words, it's not possible to become a teacher at that level after a certain period of time. No, no, no. That's the graduation. Hmm. At that point, you're going to be sent forth. Remember what it says. Go back to Matthew 24. <clears throat> Who then is a faithful and wise servant? So this is the prerequisite. You've been called you are faithful. You are totally wholeheartedly committed. You're totally sold out for the Lord. It's a pre prerequisite for being in this group. And it says, who is that person? In other words, the one that meets these qualifications. <clears throat> whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household. So that individual had been called from eternity for this moment. He's going to be an authority over the Lord's household. Who's the Lord's household? The elder group. Two, give them meat in due season. Notice it doesn't say just to give them meat. Because to give them meat would mean that you have a temporal calling to teach. Or to be a prophet or whatever it is. This is in due season. I looked that up. It means when it is required. Does that require to give in that specific period of time, does that require an anointing? Sure. So, so somebody couldn't say, I read the, uh, I read the Matthew 24, 45 to 47, I like the sound of it, I'm now going to go and give in due season. That, that's just not possible. No. For a, they wouldn't even no. know what we're no, talking You don't meet about. the requirements. Right. Yes. So exactly what, what, what you guys are saying. I'm thinking, as, as a teacher, you're going to be giving them meat if they choke on the meat you have to deliver another way maybe grind it up i don't know <laughs> the thing of it is you see strong meat is for the mature so if you're going to take them from infants to mature individuals then you you have to be you know what amount you can give them in, at a particular time, you can't you can't give it all to in one day. You have to sure, sure. gradually, you know, feed. Well, understand. <clears throat> number one, this is going to be in a different reality. Number mm -hmm. two, he never uses the word milk. He says to give them meat okay. in due 
sees the prototokis is not like a person who has a temporal calling. Yeah. A prototokis is somebody, yeah, they start off with the basics and then that's it. They're, they're prime for me. I'm thinking about those that are going to be coming from other religions. Doesn't matter. They don't have the principles. Doesn't that... matter. Doesn't matter. They've been programmed from eternity. Right, right. They're prototokis. I understand how, how, how you can see things because we've been dealing with humans right. ever since. Right. But when you run cross paths with the prototokis, mm -hmm. it's a radically different situation. Mm -hmm. Number one, they, within them, they have been designed for meat. Mm -hmm. Number two, they are hungry for meat. These people that are over in Iran and in, in communist China are fed up with that stuff. Sure. They detest it. They're trying to walk away from it. They need, they're looking for, they're crying out for the strong meat. So when this happens, and the Lord's voice, he, he, he roars from on high, in the roaring, they're going to feel a beckoning to come to this place? Well, number one, they will know, number, number one, that the roaring and the, <clears throat> the pronouncement's not for them. Okay. They're going to identify with that. Number two, the Holy Spirit is going to have them primed. Remember what we said, this falls on the wicked. Mm. And nothing to do with the righteous. After this takes place, the Lord is dealing with his people. Totally different way. Gently calling. Gently taking the teachers from around the world who have already been primed for this moment and sending them forth to shepherd these people that he's going to send into their lives. God has all of this. Look at the book of Acts. And when you see the blueprint of what's going to happen here. When Acts took place, the first church was formed. What happened? The people that were called immediately went forward to hear and to receive the apostles' doctrine. 24 7. They said it went from place to place to place. They couldn't get enough of it. Mm. Why? Under the Holy Spirit, they were receiving something that was to them priceless, that they gladly laid down their wealth, right. and gave it to whoever would need it, and went off. This is what's going to happen here, only on a greater scale. God has prepared those to receive what they have been created to receive before this world came into being. Yes. So they have the voice the elders you're referring to, they have the voice, they have the Holy Spirit in them, their programming, and you could also say the fact that they're operating within that new reality is an additional element. Well, the, uh, the idea is they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. The Holy Spirit is going to lead them. They're going to be in the same position that an Old Testament oh, saint okay. would be. Yes, yes. They're going to have ears to be led by the Holy Spirit who right. is going to amalgamate them in a group under a prototokus teacher. Since the Holy Spirit is not in them because they're not yet born again, mm -hmm. how do they recognize the, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit? It's just, they just know. The way an Old Testament saint would be led to the Holy Spirit. Okay. You know that you know that you know right. this is what you must do because right. it's in sync with your, inner, with your inner spirit. Yes. Because the gathering is to prepare them for the rapture, to make the rapture, mm -hmm. therefore will they become born again before then? Sure. They become born again when they come under your teaching. They're going to be drawn to you by the Spirit. The Spirit's going to say, here, Brace, these are those that are assigned to you. Take them, give them the whole counsel of God, starting with the new birth. Mm -hmm. You'll know what to do. Right, Amen. right. That's right. what we've been trained for. Yes. <clears throat> and in that respect, there won't. <laughs> I know it's going to be difficult. It's difficult to comprehend because we've been dealing with this nonsense here ever mm. since its inception. But it, when the Holy Spirit is allowed to be what He is and do what He does in us and in others, you're going to see a radically different yes. set of situation circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a 24-7 situation. Uh, a church service will consist of a gathering yes. of 
the outpouring of the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, healing, revelation, knowledge, mostly teaching, preparing them for where they're going, what's waiting for them, them preparing, be prepared to receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You're going to do exactly what Paul did, exactly what he taught, which was not him, but was the Lord. He was the first to promulgate it, but we continue at this point where we are free to do so. Mm. Paul says, now that you're saved, I'm praying the Father will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him so you can prepare yourself for your calling and for your inheritance. Right. And in that way, you're, gonna, you're not going to have any opposition whatsoever. Right. You're going to have a captive audience that will hang on your every word because this is what they need, this is what they want. And in a very short period of time, they're going to grow to a state of Maturity. Excellent. There's no preparing their minds and you know, no, no, knocking, no, knocking out no, the human. No, 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 yeah. no, 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 They're going to gravitate <coughs> exactly where they need to be. But let's continue. <coughs> Scripture teaches after the destruction of the Adamic order. The Lord will return to gather his sheep into church communities and he will have YHVH gather back the dispersed tribes to Israel. Mm -hmm. Turn to Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 9 to 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. So this is telling us some very interesting things here. Number one, it says he's going to make it known to those that are participating in this. Number two, it's saying he's going to get good pleasure in the Prototokos teachers that receive this. And go forth with it. Yes. This was one of my questions that I didn't write down that the Lord just reminded me through you. This exact scripture right here. Now the thing of it is it says, according to his good pleasure, okay, which he hath purposed in himself. Yes. So he's setting things up to give him himself pleasure. Yep. And that, that's a fascinating thing to me because it doesn't sound like my Lord and Savior, <laughs> but that's what he's done because I don't understand it yet. So can you please elaborate a little bit more? Well, the good pleasure comes about as a result of the individual responding to his will. Mm -hmm. He'll set things up that are negative. And the negative is only for one purpose. It's a weeding out process. The person that endures the negative enters into the positive and does what the fathers call them to do gives them great, great pleasure. And this is what we were talking about before. <clears throat> but Jesus had to do, do always those things that please the Father. When the Father puts us in a negative and we refuse to be boxed in and limited by what the enemy wants us to focus on in that negative, and we bring the Father into the picture, and we make Him bigger than the circumstance we're dealing with, it gives Him great pleasure. That's what Jesus did all the time. That's what Paul did all the time. And that's why the Father will single you out and say, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Well pleased. But let's go on. <clears throat> that 
in the dispensation of the fullness of time. So we see a time period here. The dispensation of the fullness. Things have to happen. Matthew 24, verses 6 to 8. Wars, rumors of wars, commotions, things are happening. It hasn't reached the fullness of times. He says, don't worry about this. The end has not yet arrived. But when you see nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, this is the dispensation of the fullness of times. This is what we're supposed to focus on. This is where the X, Y axis crosses and we enter into our own. Notice what he says. <clears throat> In this dispensation of the fullest of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The gathering, the gathering, I can't stress it enough. The gathering is the reality that we are entering into. All aspects of the gathering. Our focus is totally in that, within that framework. Not what's going on in the collapse of nations. Not what's happening about the Luciferians. Not what's going on in um, <clears throat> the heavens. But only as it pertains to the gathering. That's what we have been called from, prepared for, and willing to enter into that will please the Father. That's what makes us, will make us wise. People are going to be in states of confusion, panic, terror, because they won't be able to comprehend what's going. They think it's the end of the world. Uh, they're trying to hold on to what they have. and all. When you understand the gathering, which is what the Father is saying here, the aspects of the gathering become the sole focus of your attention. And you incorporate everything, good and bad, in a state of comprehension. And you're using wisdom, wisdom to deal with every aspect of what's taking place. You know that the clock has started ticking, that the Lord is going to at some point descend from heaven to speak to those that you have been faithful in bringing to his location, which is what we want to pursue here. <coughs> Scripture teaches at a time of tumultuous upheavals on earth and in the heavens he will appear to gather his sheep and reward the faithful that have fed them with their inheritance. Drop down to verse 11. I want you to know, we're going to look at this, this aspect of inheritance because it spans both the Old Testament and the New Testament as it pertains to the gathering. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. And repeat that. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. In eternity, he predestinated how the inheritance would be distributed. <clears throat> the inheritance, number one, it's twofold. We have an inheritance in the Father, a joint inheritance in the Son. It's going to be dispensed in a process of progressional events. We said you come into the inheritance at the time he descends in the gathering. You ascend to the position over the estate. Then you are going to be glorified in which you assume the fullness of sonship. So it's a staged uh, uh, a progression that we enter into in receiving our inheritance in Christ. Yes. Where it says, each man in his own order. Mm -hmm. What is that saying about what you just now told us? Well, the, the rest of that is, Christ the first fruits, and them that are his at his coming. So he was the first who received everything that was due him as a son, 
And each man in his own order, you have those that have a temporal calling, those that have an eternal calling, at Christ's coming, at Christ's coming, each one is going to receive his inheritance. Matter of fact, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15 chapter. That's what you're alluding to. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15th chapter, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 15, verse 23. But every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, afterward, afterward. They that are Christ at his coming. Now, he's going to come three times. He's going to come at the gathering, the rapture, second coming. Those that are his are going to enter into their inheritance at each calling, depending on what group you happen to be in. <clears throat> the Prototokos teachers <clears throat> at the first coming, where he comes together. The Prototokos group, elders and teachers at the rapture. And then all those who are on secondary levels at the second coming. And each time he comes, it's a judgment and a reward system. But the Morganized religion only teaches two. And they teach those in obscurity, but the Bible teaches three comings. Let's go on. <clears throat> We said scripture teaches that a time of tumultuous upheavals on earth and in the heavens, he will appear to gather his sheep and reward the faithful that have fed them with their inheritance. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 46 to 47. Matthew 24, verse 46. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Now, when is this coming? Is this the rapture, second coming, or the gathering? Gathering. Exactly. Gathering. Exactly. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so <coughs> doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Interesting. Turn to Luke 21. Yes. Ruler mm -hmm. over all his goods. Yes. So, his goods have to be people. Sure. <laughs> And animals, but the thing of it is, is you're possessing a you're, you're you're mandated to be a developer by by you. Otherwise, what are you going to do with your inheritance if you're not ruling over it? Then actually, the word uh, goods there is possessions. You're already a ruler over his household. You're going to be a ruler of what? What does he possess? Creation. Angels, archangels, thrones, dominions, <laughs> principles. Those are his possessions. Sure. Uh, turn to Luke 21. And we want... Verses 25 to 27. Mm -hmm. 
There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, upon the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, man's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So this is going to be, this is going to be sudden outbreak of convulsions in the heavens and on the earth, basically proceeding, preceding his sudden appearance. He goes on to say, Then, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, what is this? The rapture, second coming, or the gathering? Yeah. How do you know? <laughs> Cause he's, because he's coming to give me something. That's how I know. How do you know? It's only one way you really know. And that's dropping down to verse 36. Okay. Watch ye therefore and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand and right. to stand right. before the Son of Man. So it couldn't possibly be the rapture or the second coming. If it were the rapture, you're not going to stand before Him. If it's the second coming, then you haven't made the rapture because He said you'll escape all these things and stand before Him. If it was the rapture, you'd be coming back with Him. You could say also in verse 27, there's no shout to you. No, no, it's not. Uh, but the idea but is... But doesn't that imply that since there's no shout, that it's obviously not the rapture? Well, it wouldn't necessarily say so. Okay. But it's talking about two things here. When you see it saying coming in a cloud, that's just him descending personally. Second coming is coming with the clouds. Okay. Those are the saints that are here. At the time he comes in a cloud, they now have gone to the higher positions and glorification so they come back with him in each one has his own cloud so just let you know this is not the second coming it's not the rapture it's got to be the gathering now when he comes and the nations are gathered before him Two things, remember what we said when we first started this lesson. It said evil is going to fall on the evil, on the wicked. The, 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 the judgment is only going to fall on the wicked, so they're out. The humans who survived that are not going to be part of the gathering because they're not subject to the Holy Spirit. They're not prepared. He's going to gather the righteous into their possessions. Now, I want you to note, note something here. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the Lord returns to enable His faithful to enter into their inheritance <coughs> in Him. Turn back to Ephesians, the first chapter. And we're going to go to Romans. Ten and eleven. Then in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both of which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom, in whom, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, the Father, who work with all things after the counsel of his own will. So the inheritance dovetails with the gathering. There is going to be a dispension of an inheritance 
when he returns at the gathering. Now the scripture goes into a little further. Romans 8, 16 to 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, the Father, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Of course, the glorification here is referring to the rapture, in which we receive the fullness of sonship. But that... <coughs> takes place at the glorification. We have two phases of receiving an inheritance. Yes. The rapture is also called the adoption? Yes. Yes. Now what we're going to receive at this point I believe comes from the Father. That is <clears throat> the inheritance which makes us uh, the prototokos teachers in the heavens. You say, why is that? Turn to Deuteronomy. Did you say what happens at this point, meaning what we're reading here? What we're reading here is the rapture. Right. That's where you see the fullness. Okay. What we're talking about now okay. is what we receive when... Turn to the gallery. Gotcha. <clears throat> Where are we going? Okay. We're going to Deuteronomy. Scripture indicates the sheep who come from every part are the descendants of Adam. In other words, the reason they talk about every kindred and tongue of people and nation is referring to them being. <clears throat> <clears throat> the sons of Adam, descendants of Adam, constituting the human race. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. This is referring to the gathering. You say, how do you know? Notice, let's take it, break it down. When the Most High, let's talk about Elohim, not YHVH. There is no place in the scripture where you can find Elohim dividing anything to the human race. Everything in the first part of the scripture from Genesis, the second chapter on, is all YHVH. But this is YHVH. This is Elohim. Yeah, the most this high. Is the most high, right? El Yon. I thought you said this was YHVH. No. I said this is not YHVH. Okay. You cannot find anywhere in the scripture where El Yon does this. Gotcha. It's, it's all YHVH that does this, and that's Genesis, the ninth chapter, tenth chapter, eleventh chapter after the flood. Okay. He spreads the human race abroad. Notice what it says though. <clears throat> when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. Now this runs totally contrary to everything we've been talking about. 
the human race is disinherited from the surface world. They have no inheritance. The Luciferians have the inheritance. So if it's talking here about Elyon dividing the inheritance, it can only be one group that received the inheritance. The Prototokis that received the gathering. What is the inheritance? The inheritance is the community in which each group is going to settle. Why? Because it gives them right to be there. It's their inheritance from the Father. Remember, the Luciferians have been given the authority to to dominate the surface world and the human race. At this point, the, uh, the elders have not been glorified, neither have the prototypist teachers been glorified. They're still part of the human race. So the Luciferians would have authority to uproot anybody and kick them out or take charge of whatever it is they want because they have now been given the covenant relationship to dominate the earth. A race of giants who come in there and drive everybody out. The humans have no authority to stay where they are <clears throat> and do what they're doing. Two groups have the inheritance. Israel and the Prototokos. The humans, remember what we said, they kill mingle with the Luciferians under the shadow of the Luciferians. Remember what we read in Revelation. The Church of Pergamos is in the area of Lucifer's dominion. His, his throne is right there. If they didn't have title claim, Lucifer could just take... Gotcha. Okay. So the purpose of the inheritance at that point is to establish dominion for the Prototokos to be there. No one can, can exactly. do anything. Exactly. Yes. And everybody knows it. Hmm. Everybody knows. I like that part. When the Most High divided to the nations, who are the nations? The ones you read about in Revelation, the fifth chapter, verse 9. You have redeemed us out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation on the earth. Human nations. It's the elder group. They haven't ascended yet. They're still on earth. This is the gathering. He returns to disperse them to the places where they're going to settle. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. Well, where did inheritance come from? It came from Him. Where did He get it from? From the Father. Their sons. And the Father gives the sons an inheritance. When He separated the sons of Adam. So He's going to <coughs> separate them into global communities under the leadership of the Prototokos teachers. Notice what he goes on to say. <clears throat> when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. So you have two groups. You have YHVH giving being given authority to take back the tribes of Israel to the lands in which they originally were settled. You have the church community settling, resettling the areas where they once did settle and new communities of course being established. But the ancient communities, Pergamos, Sardis, Laodicea, uh, Ephesus, those are communities that were in the book of Revelation originally given to the churches. I perhaps mis misheard you when you said the church communities are settling in the place where once they did settle. You mean the old churches, the ancient churches? Yes. I'm with you now. Yes, yes. People look at Revelation and they think it's past. Right. But it's future. Because John says, I was taken to uh, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day so he's taken out of his time into the future our time and he sees these communities 
He's told to take the seven communities, seven churches, and write to them. So it's not the churches of the past, it's the churches that are going to be established at this time, the communities. And in that respect, you find two things. You're in Deuteronomy, turn to Joshua, first chapter. Verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel, this is their inheritance. Every place where the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and from this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, unto the great sea toward the going down of the plain, going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee in all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So you got two groups. You have Israel who have an inheritance. They've been uprooted. They're going to go back to that inheritance. You have the church. Same thing. They had an inheritance. They were uprooted. When this thing is over, they're going to be returned back to their inheritance. To stay and be taught to prepare for the rapture and the tribulation era. And of course, the things of heaven and their, their death calling, their destiny, everything along that line. 